I'm Keith Stokes. I'm Medical Research Lead at the Rugby Football Union. Uh, we've been doing some work to try and assess the transmission risks uh, of variations of the game of rugby. Uh, and I'm going to give you an overview of the work that we've been doing to try and determine uh, the best route back to competitive grassroots rugby. So the starting point is that the options for the return to community team sport of any type are really driven by uh, the community COVID prevalence and the trans transmission risks of the specific sport. And the work that we've been doing is to try and understand those risks. We think that full contact 15 aside rugby transmission risk is one of the highest of all outdoor team sports. And so it makes it really important that we understand how we can best progress back to that 15 aside game. To get the game started again, we need to begin with a lower transmission risk rugby activity. And this really looks like variations of touch rugby. So in order to assess the risk of rugby, we used a team sport risk exposure framework, which is a requirement that the government has placed on us uh, to show uh, the level of risk in our sport. What I'm going to do now is take you through the different uh, considerations that we might look at uh, when we're uh, assessing the risk in, in any sport and specifically in rugby. So during training and game events, each player's proximity interactions are considered in terms of how far away from each other they are. If players are more than one meter apart, then we consider that as a low risk activity. If they are less than one meter down to actually there being physical contact, then we need to consider that slightly differently. We then start to look at actually the orientation of players and particularly whether they are face to face or not. If they are not face to face, and this might include standing side to side or back to back, then we look at the amount of time that the player will spend in that position uh, compared to another player. If this interaction is fleeting, so this is less than three seconds, then we would consider that to be a low risk activity. However, if that interaction is longer than three seconds, then we would consider that to be a medium risk activity. When we have medium risk activities, we need to consider how we mitigate that risk and how we reduce that risk so that it is a safer thing to do. We also uh, will need to add together the amount of time that is spent doing that type of activity to see if it reaches a, a threshold. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. If we go back to our uh, orientation of players, if the players are within one meter and are face to face, if that interaction is less than three seconds, we go back into our medium risk category. If we accumulate more than 15 minutes of these medium risk activities, then we would consider that to be an overall increased risk uh, during that training, a session or that game. The biggest problem for us, however, is the face-to-face -face, uh, non-fleeting activities. These immediately go into the increased risk activity. And this is important Firstly, we need to consider how we might mitigate that risk. But secondly, these would definitely be considered to be uh, close contacts uh, in a test and trace situation. So if a player uh, was in that training session or in that game um, and had COVID-19, uh, then any of the other people that have had those types of interactions with that player would be considered uh, to be uh, at risk. Our goal throughout this whole process uh, has been to prevent this increased risk activity. So to remove that red aspect on this graph. So we want to take away any interactions that are uh, non-fleeting face-to-face actions. And we want to also re reduce the amount of time that people might accumulate in this medium risk uh, activity. The question is, why are we worried about the red? Well, if we look at this graph, so that the, the the top bit is the same as the previous slide, uh, but underneath this shows the relationship 
between these low, medium and increased risk activities and really what we think about how much the risk increases. And so what we think is that the increased risk activities have a much higher risk than the medium risk and certainly than the low risk activities. And this isn't just something that increases in a straight line. Actually, the red area is the, is the thing that we really want to avoid. So thinking about rugby, uh, what we know is that rugby's exposure risk is concentrated in the forwards. This is because of the type of activities that they take part in. So for example, the scrum uh, involves face-to-face -face contact for front row players in particular. And this has been described uh, by Public Health England experts as a micro environment of low ventilation. We know that ventilation or the airflow is important and that's why there's so much greater risk um, of uh, contracting COVID when you are inside compared to when you are outside. And the concern is that the scrum creates an environment where air cannot flow very well. Other activities are things like the line out that results in a maul in particular, and also tackles where both players are upright and face to face. We've done analysis to work out how many uh, different game events occur in the community game. And we've characterized this using the framework that I've just explained into low risk, medium risk and increased risk events. If we look at the increased risk events, then on average, we see 21 scrums uh, that occur per game. And we can see here that in the setup to the scrum, the front rows are face to face. Uh, there's an opportunity for transmission there. And once you get into the position of scrummaging, then we've got this concern around there being a microenvironment of low ventilation that's been described. Tackles fit in both the medium risk uh, category and also the increased risk category, depending on the nature of the tackle. So we think that uh, tackles whereby uh, one player is upright and one player is bent over uh, are medium risk activities. Whereas if both players are upright, uh, we see that as an increased risk activity. In terms of line outs, uh, for most players, um, this is not a major concern during the setup for the line out, but potentially the jumper and the lifter in front of them uh, spend some time face to face uh, before the line out, before the ball is thrown in. Clearly during the line out, uh, there's no major problems. But if that line out results in a maul, then this is seen as a high risk activity. And we think on average that this happens uh, around eight times per game. So when we start to put together uh, the amount of time that players spend in medium risk and increased risk categories, according to the uh, framework that I've described, we can look at different positions and we can determine how much time they're spending at risk. So on the left hand side here, we have the different positional groups. In the middle, we've got the medium risk activities and the number of those that occur per game and the total time that is spent in those activities. On the right hand side, we've got the increased risk, the number and the total time. What we can see is that for most positions, uh, the medium risk activities do not reach that 15 minute threshold that puts the players at, at high or increased risk. However, the second row get close and the back row do go over that 15 minute threshold. So they would be considered to be at increased risk during a normal rugby match. What we also see is that all of the forwards are exposed to this increased risk activity, primarily as a result of the scrums, uh, the malls, um, and some also due to upright tackles. What's noticeable, however, is that the backs don't have any of this increased risk activity. Our goal, as I've said, is to reduce or 
uh, prevent that increased risk activity. We've also looked at lower exposure risk variations of the game and specifically looked at variations of touch rugby. We've looked at uh, traditional touch rugby, but also at two touch or ready for rugby. What we note is that there are face to face interactions during these games, but these are fleeting interactions and the overall time spent in these medium risk activities is relatively low. The key difference here, though, is that there is no red increased risk activity. And this was our goal at the outset was to remove that and both of these variations of the game uh, achieve that. So the key take home message is that restarting rugby using variations of touch rugby, which may be traditional touch or it may be two touch ready for rugby, removes the increased transmission risk game events and that's the rationale for the approach that we're taking. We settled on 20 players as a maximum because we know that uh, the more people that are involved, the higher the risk uh, of, of infection. Um, so smaller groups are clearly uh, better. The professional game, when they move to the second stage of their training, uh, where they introduce contact training, um, started with 20 players. And so we're confident that that's an appropriate approach to use. But this will, of course, be under ongoing review and will be looked at at each stage of development. Tag rugby is only really played at under seven and under eight level. The challenge with having tags or any equipment is that it needs to be cleaned regularly. And we don't really feel that at under sevens and under eights, uh, it's very realistic to ask them to uh, clean those tags every time somebody has, has touched it. Introducing tag rather than touch to any other level of the game uh, does not appear to be uh, necessary when we have a variation of the game uh, that allows it to be played just using touch. In CHC, the only equipment that should be used is that which is essential for the game. Realistically, this means it's just a ball. In some situations, it may be a cone uh, to mark out the pitch or a set of cones to mark out the pitch as well. The use of any other equipment is unnecessary at this stage because the nature of the game is touch rugby. As we develop towards um, more full contact uh, aspects of the game, the use of equipment will be reviewed. The challenge with using any equipment is the possibility of that uh, equipment uh, becoming um, contaminated and therefore running the risk of transmitting uh, the infection.